Hey ho, Tutor Minded people. I'm Gage. I'm Jessica. We're Tutor Time Machine, and this is episode 22 of our podcast. Thank you for joining us. Leave us a comment on our Tutor Time Machine Facebook page because we really love hearing your thoughts. And ask us any questions you have. We'd love to answer them. Yes, and if you're new here, it's best to start at episode one. This is a story project, and it goes in order. We're so excited to be reaching thousands of tutor-minded people from all over the world. What an awesome community. (laughs) Listeners who love a story and also love history. You are our kind of people. Absolutely. And we've had such a great time researching and imagining this project and especially bringing it to you. It's a real pleasure. And if you're enjoying it, support us digitally. Buy me a coffee. And buy me a coffee. Type in buy me a coffee as one word and then Tudor Time Machine into your search engine and you can find our page or the shop button on our Tudor Time Machine Facebook page will also take you to buymeacoffee.com where you can support us. And as a bonus gift for your support at any level, we will send you our Tudor Time Machine Behind the Headlines podcast. Jesse will read a current Tudor news story and then we'll discuss it in depth, debunking fake news or delving into worthy headlines. We're really looking forward to having some great guests join these discussions on our special bonus episodes. So support us on buymeacoffee.com and get in on this new Tudor Time Machine fun. At this point in our story, Constance and Philomena are returning to the home of Sir Henry and Lady Lee. The Lees have a desk that belonged to Sir Henry's uncle, Sir Thomas Wyatt, because everyone is related in the Tudor period. (laughs) And named Henry and Thomas. (laughs) Constance hope that there are letters in the desk that might lead her to the relic. After the reading, we'll have some fun discussing the history beyond our tale and making connections between then and now. Read on, Jessie. Chapter 22, Savoy House, the home of Sir Henry and Lady Lee, in which Philomena plays the thief and Cecilia the avenging angel. Lady Lee made a high-pitched fuss over the black work, and then over Philomena. Constance had not considered that bringing her friend would be interpreted as a kind of show, an alliance that should be noted. Her hostess, no doubt, curdled inside at having to laud a merchant woman. Yet no one knew when they might need to borrow money or find a buyer. Lady Lee clucked over the elegant wave of Philomena's hair, and Philomena returned compliment for compliment in the cordiality duel. The lady of the house said she would step away for only a moment by my honour, assuring her guests that a visit to the nursery would soon be arranged. Then Charles was at the door. His commanding presence produced a look from Philomena, which brought Constance pride, as if she herself were somehow responsible for his stature and wide shoulders. Constance joined him in the far corner of the room, donning the serious face he admired. What would he think of the pearl-throwing Cecilia? Surely he would see how spectacular she was. Perhaps Constance herself could entertain Charles with a description of the scene at Bedford House. Or perhaps he would think it wrong of her to gossip about her mistress. Before she could decide, he took her hand. She stifled a giggle, and the urge to look back at Philomena. I have guessed your true desire, he said. Despite everything sensible, his words made Constance anxious. Could he have divined that she was here under false pretenses? Impossible. It is not my sister you wish to see, it is myself, and I find it a laudable compliment to me and to you, sweet Constance. Oh, you have found me out, she said happily, and yet simultaneously wishing he would leave, so Wyatt's desk might be examined. Instead, Charles squeezed her fingers and looked into her eyes. Why did he not go? Did not gentlemen have important business to attend to in the afternoon? Riding or sword fighting? Greek learning or something? How long was Charles going to stay? He spoke softly. I could never marry a heretic as my sister has. The nursery awaits, the mistress of the house announced, by way of saying the infant had been scrubbed of milk slop. Philomena saw her chance and sprang into action, swaying a bit as she stood. Lady Lee's exclamation betrayed the fear of illness which Constance had anticipated. "'Worry not, madam,' Constance said, playing the moment with melodrama. "'Tis the thought of her mother's condition. Loving concern has seized her. Mistress Arundel only needs a moment alone.' 
Philomena made a sad face and focused her eyes at an unseen horizon while lowering herself into a recline onto a bench. Lady Lee pressed her heart in sympathy and led Charles and Constance away. The desk was exactly as expected. Pulling out the first of the two large drawers, Philomena could see that it held no secret compartment. She pulled out the next and was rewarded. Using her fingernails, she flipped up the false bottom. There they were, a bundle of letters tied with a ribbon. Sounds! She drew them out and quickly shoved them into the pocket of her skirt. Boots in the hallway, her heart in her mouth. She pushed the drawer back. Sir Henry Lee greeted her, and she looked up at him, startled, as if an overpowering admiration for wooden inlay had absorbed her completely. Sir Henry, your home and furnishings are so lovely. Huzzah! Indeed, indeed. What taste you have for a woman of the city. I do believe the rich merchants hope to overrun the court. Sir, the court is for those who are born to it. Those of my sort only wish to be near it. Courtiers, Philomena thought, believed this across the board. Not one of them wondered if it were repeated flattery. This Virguenio is a prize. On this very surface, the lauded poet, my uncle, Sir Thomas Wyatt, penned his verses. It is doubly valued then, sir. This man's infatuation with this objet, the way he caressed it, convinced Philomena that Sir Henry had examined every part of it, opened each drawer, maybe noted the false bottom, even discovered the letters. He would miss them, a wrinkle to be ironed out if the time came. Talent and passion have long run in my family, a further speech formed on Sir Henry's tongue. After young Wyatt's execution, all that created the fine appointment of Arlington Castle, my poet uncle's home, was absconded with by Queen Mary. Yet, as it is bound to, the rota fortuna has turned in this new glorious reign of our sovereign Elizabeth. The name of Wyatt has lost its tarnish. By the will of our gracious queen, and not in a little part by my pleading on the family's behalf, Her Majesty has agreed to restore some of the Wyatt's family goods. I am blessed with the favour of the Queen, who I have the inexpressible joy of counting as one of my childhood playmates. Sir Henry smoothed the two sides of his ginger whiskers between thumb and index finger. Lady Jane Wyatt, young Thomas's widow, presented this verguenio exotique to me in homage. I champion her son George, and lose no opportunity to use my deep influence with Lord William Cecil and Lord Nicholas Bacon, both men who count myself as a conciliare. This studious George Wyatt would never have been accepted as a student at Barnard's Inn without my beneficence. From there the young man shall be in due time, and with my urging, admitted to Gray's Inn and on the path to renown. Henry Lee took a breath and began the long history of his own superior education, pressing his connection to the poet Wyatt who oversaw it. Philomena nodded pensively, while edging nearer and nearer to the door. Then, with a low curtsy and the excuse that she did not want to miss seeing the baby, she escaped. In the nursery, a contortion of excuses to Lady Lee was made easy. By the beginnings of a sleeting rain, Constance could truly say pushed Philomena and herself to leave before they wished to. In the boat, Constance exulted. You found something! It went exactly as intended, Constance. The letters are in my pocket. Oh, Philomena, I'm impatient to read them, but this rain is so terrible. That Sir Henry, the caresses he has for the desk, an oddity. He shall notice it was disturbed, and I stood just beside. Constance brushed off Philomena's concern. I'm sure he shall not. It is doubtful that he even knew the letters were there. The oarsman hacked and coughed as he rowed. His breath was wheezy. Constance did not like to look at him and turned her attention to her gloves. Heavens, Sir Henry Lee is following us, Philomena pointed behind them. Constance saw a boat with a servant sporting Lee's livery, rowing hard. Gee, Sue! Philomena leaned over to the oarsman, a coin in hand. Sirrah, can you pull just a bit faster? You think a coin will make me a young man? Two coins? If I row myself to death, 
You will just push my body over the side and not shed a single tear. I shall, said Constance, wondering what Henry Lee would do if he caught them. I promise I shall cry very hard. Taking the coins and muttering, the oarsman began to pull in earnest. He proved strong, and with some distance between the two vessels, they clunked into the dock. Constance and Philomena hauled themselves out, their wet feet running up the slippery water stairs in such a way as ladies never did. Constance grabbed Philomena's elbow and led her to Bedford House. Bursting through the door, they found Cecilia in the entryway, with a falcon on her arm. Oh, is it raining out? My bird is so intelligent. I encourage it to fly at the snakes in the tapestries, but it will not. Oh, princess, Constance was breathless. A man pursues us. The knock on the door came at that moment. All Cecilia's ladies positioned themselves to receive. Constance caught her breath. Would the princess help them or hand them over? Hide there, behind that doorway. Christina's, Cecilia ordered. One Christina ran for the Vasa banner, struck a pose and draped herself. Constance and Philomena took a position just out of sight, and a servant disappeared, returning to announce Sir Henry Lee. As his footsteps approached, the other Christina's strong soprano began a Swedish folk song. "'Princess Cecilia, my greetings to you, noble lady,' Sir Henry said. "'While the joy of seeing your honourable self would be more than reason enough to brave such inclement weather, I come on a further errand. I believe you have a lady here, Mistress Philomena Arundel, whom I wish to speak to, and if you would be so kind, alone.' "'Does Mistress Arundel wish to speak to you, Sir Henry, alone?' Madam, I am master of the ordinance. I am in awe, sir, yet do not comprehend the relevance. Silence followed. Constance imagined a more cautious Sir Henry, sizing up the situation, and the enormous bird of prey on the royal arm. Princess Cecilia's voice was on the air. If you have something to say, sir, say it with me present, and I shall summon whomever you like. I do not leave poor maidens unaccompanied with men who might upset them. Dearest princess, I have heard you are fond of sweets, Sir Henry tempted. My lord, your talk is all ellipses. I am, but I am more fond of my ladies. Mistress Arundel has stolen something from me, and I demand its return. This is a ruse. If I permit you to be alone, you will steal something from the girl which can never be returned. Madam, you insult my honour. And you, sir, insult my worldliness. Now, now, Sir Henry, I see who would be the thief here. Mistress Arundel has taken refuge in my house, and I shall not give her up to any man. Madam, I demand to have that which is mine returned, Sir Henry insisted. What is owed you? That is private. Ah, then we are back on the same subject. I shall not give the lady up to any private dealings with you, my fine sir. You are too bold. Mistress Arundel is not one of your household, madam, to have such authority over any maiden pursued is one of mine are not we poor women to defend each other against such insults on virtue because mistress arundel is not in my employ i should give her up to vice shame on you sir henry shame constance heard cecilia's voice vibrate with righteousness she peeked around. Sir Henry was not his dapper self. His hat was on his head like a pancake, and his coat was only belted, not fastened. Cecilia was lifting her free arm, Constance thought, like the angel Michael, her voice the final trumpet. Go, go, and cool your ardour. Your bawdy thirst shall not be quenched under my roof by God. She swept her arm down, banishing Sir Henry to the door and causing the sharp-eyed falcon to screech. Sir Henry, veins popping from his skull, had no choice. He retreated. Constance and Philomena bowed down at the royal feet, but the princess beckoned them to rise and then exploded into a fit of laughter. Her women, their expressions quickly falling in line with their mistresses, joined in. Your grace gave him a piece of your mind. The man was a whipped dog. Yeah, yeah, his tail was long between his feet. Be gentle, my ladies. Sir Henry defended himself as he was able, Cecilia said. Madam, you have shown your wit, and we stand in your debt. 
Philomena choked, pressing her fist to her chest. And do I not stand in your debt, Mistress Arundel, your discretion, your acumen? Cecilia volleyed. And when I look at you, my young wisdom, I am astonished. You are but the age of our Constance, who we love as a babe, and yet the maze of this world does not frighten you. I look forward to your grace's return to my humble establishment, Philomena curtsied. Now, my little wet kittens, you are both a sight. Run, run upstairs and dry your fur before the fire. Settling in on Constance's bed, Philomena opened the packet and handed one of the letters to Constance. These do not look so very old. Constance read, You inflame my ardor as no man has? This appears to be a woman's hand, but it cannot be from Wyatt's sister. You stand far higher, my Lord Mars, than any other. Your hot vapor burns like the sun. Philomena unfolded another. The Amazons at the wedding were for you. Even as I lie with my new husband, it is as if I am a chaste one-breasted warrior. I dream of you riding out to the joust, the queen's champion, but still my own great lion. Philomena, wedding, Amazons, the queen's champion, Lady Anne Russell, or should I say the Countess of Warwick and Sir Henry Lee? Constance asked in disbelief. Sir Henry is not material for a lover? Indeed, no. Sir Henry would spend his passion on the delicacy of the linen or the shaft of mahogany at the bedpost. Constance pawed through the letters. Surely there was something that was from the poet or the sister. I thought it went so well, lamented Philomena. But there is nothing, Constance moaned. And you risked so much. You have made an enemy of Sir Henry for ever, Philomena. It is no waste to have a courtier's secrets in your pocket. I am not concerned. Sir Henry followed out of fear of blackmail, but I will win the hand and return these silly scribbles. That will be the end of it. The risk of me spilling his cuckolding of the Earl of Warwick will prevent Sir Henry from speaking ill of me, Philomena said. Constance could not believe how fully she had given herself to this escapade, as if she thought they would open a drawer and the relic would be there for the taking. What a disappointment for Constance. No clues to the relic in the desk, just lusty notes to Sir Henry Lee from the newly married Countess of Warwick. So we don't know that Sir Henry was cheating on his wife with the Countess of Warwick, but we do know that he was a cheater. He had a very public affair with Queen Elizabeth's maid of honor, Anne Vavasour, and he had a son with Ms. Vavasour. And Vavasour is such a great name for a mistress. Va va voom. And apparently she was pretty va voomy. She was the Earl of Oxford's mistress before she took up with Sir Henry. And she was also accused of bigamy for being married to two other men at the same time. That sounds very confusing. Very and busy, difficult. busy. But you go, Anne. So. Actually, Henry Lee must have had a thing for ladies named Anne because his wife was also Anne. There were only a few female names in circulation. Everyone is Anne, Margaret, Elizabeth, or Mary in this time period. But chances that your wife and mistress are going to conveniently share the same name is pretty high. <laughs> yeah, no, it's true. And also that whoever you're having an affair with as a woman is probably going to have the same name. Henry, Edward, John... They're all the same names. Well, we gave Lee another Anne to contend with. We're on a roll with Anne's. Anne Russell, new Countess of Warwick, recently married to Ambrose Dudley. And actually, there's a wonderful portrait of Sir Henry made on a trip to Antwerp in 1568 by Antonis Marr. And this picture gave us some inspiration for Sir Henry Lee's personality. He looks very pleased with himself, but that <laughs> That's is an understatement. That is only in the beginning. But also he's wearing black and white, which were the queen's colors. But I have read so many conflicting things about Elizabeth and the colors black and white. First, that black and white were her favorite colors to wear, but I've also read that they were the only colors she permitted her ladies in waiting to wear when they were around her. I, the idea, I guess, was that if she wore brighter colors than they did, then she would stand out more dramatically against them as a sort of backdrop for her as the sun. And I've read that they were her favorite colors to wear because 
she thought that they represented her as a paragon of purity and virginity. Yeah, well, whatever the case, Henry Lee is in black and white. And just to make sure that his contemporaries saw his connection to Queen Elizabeth, he also has these armillary spheres, which is that kind of model of objects in the sky that you see that was popular at this time period. And he has it embroidered on his sleeves in black work. And the armillary sphere was a personal emblem of Queen Elizabeth, but I've also read there were other, a lot of other personal, personal em emblems. <laughs> so I guess that was the particular one he chose. But it certainly would have been sending a message to other people that he was one of the Queen's favorites, or he was making her, his connection to her. Yes, and the portrait is striking because he's looking right at us, almost challenging us. And he has around his neck a very long red ribbon and there's a ring hanging on it. Yeah, and he has his thumb like shoved through that ring. And then he has another ring which is very visible and it's tied around his elbow. So it's strange, right? Because he's looking so boldly out of this portrait. He's looking very pleased with himself. He's got on this, you know, ribbon and um, around his neck and around his elbow. And why? So our historians think that the rings and the way he's standing indicates an offer of love. Love me, <laughs> self-involved man that I am. <laughs> anyway, but that it's an offer of love and not to his wife, Anne. No, because... At this point in 1565, they'd already been married for quite some time, and she already had his wedding ring. She yes. didn't need another ring. No, so this is a sexy, symbolic gesture to someone else. And it probably would not have been to the queen herself, despite these connections that he's making with the queen, because that would have been incredibly disrespectful. It's more likely that it was to another lover. And his expression is kind of, you know, don't you want me, baby? But this is a big portrait, and he presumably had it hung in his house. A poor Lady Lee. I mean, so it's there in his house, her, his house and her house to torment her with? I guess so. I don't... Clearly it wasn't to her. No, it's very strange. We'll post a picture of it on the Tudor Time Machine Facebook page so that you can see it and tell us what you think. And would you... Be interested in that man? <laughs> anyway, in our story... He does have ginger hair, too. Another <laughs> connection to the queen. In our story, Lee is hooking up with the Countess of Warwick, and he needs those incriminating letters back. It's going to be an awkward moment when Philomena returns them. Right. Like, here are the love notes I stole from your desk that you don't want your wife to see because you have this high-ranking mistress, but that you also certainly don't want the high-ranking mistress's husband to see because he's Ambrose Dudley and he could destroy your position at court, even as your mistress, the Countess of Warwick, could help your position at court as long as your affair is kept secret. This sounds like something Henry Lee would very much get himself involved in, right? Because he was somebody who was always looking out for his own promotion. So it's awkward. But if anyone can hand back these extremely dangerous letters with discretion, I think Philomena can. I agree. But you're certainly right that the most important thing to Henry Lee would be that Dudley didn't see the letters. I mean, if it broke his wife's heart... Oh, well. Oh, well. <laughs> it, the mo it's much more important that... Yeah, because it was acceptable at this point. Yeah, absolutely. Mistress, and absolutely. you just had to deal with it. Yeah. So. so Philomena is used to negotiating this kind of... All these divides between the married and the mistresses, between the court and the city. And she has to be discreet, but also strong at the same time. And she has to look out for her own interest. Yes, absolutely. Time. She has to look out for her own interest. And she has power because she's rich and also because she runs an inn where many of these noblemen hang out and meet people, whether they're tradesmen or lovers. And she knows many things about them and she has to facilitate them, but at the same time, stay in her place. Right. And Constance sees in this chapter, in actually one of the first chapters where we really see Philomena out of the inn, um, that she's surprised by how Philomena is flattered 
or how Lady Lee flatters Phil Phil Philomena, even though Philomena is from a merchant class. Yes, Lady Lee is a much higher status person, but many of the merchant class were richer than the gentry, especially as the economy in England grew and became a 16th century business hub. Right. The gentry were often in huge debt to the merchant class who provided goods and services on credit and who actually gained status by who they sold their goods and services to. Or lent them to. Or lent them to. But then as now, you know, someone, some designer would want a movie star to wear their dress. Sure, right, absolutely. And it's amazing how rich people who are broke continue to be able to borrow money even yes. though they have i mean it, it it's the it really is then is now so i like to imagine that lady lee knows sir henry has a massive outstanding bar and also a, you know maybe room tab <laughs> at the arundel inn and she's flattering philomena hoping to keep her from calling in sir henry's account right and philomena would have been very aware of when was a good time to call in an account and when was not a good time to call in an account so that's part of her her finessing situations too um you know because the nobility the gentry they were often very rich in land holdings but very poor in cash and of course people in business were the opposite and the definition of gentry at this time was a man, uh, you know, obviously a man, just a man. Women didn't really own property on their own. So, but it was a man who owned enough property that he could live off the rents of his estate and he would not have to take on a trade. So having a trade, however lucrative, lessened your social status, even if it made you rich. Would you say now that's still true if you live only off your stocks and you don't have to have a job? You know, England has always had this thing about the gentry and the landed gentry and this this kind of problem of the landed gentry continues, right? Up, right through the Second World War, you know, like how are they going to get cash? How are they going to get cash? But, you know, Americans put such a premium on work and the value of work. And we like to see people work, 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 working. So I, I just think it's a different, it's, it's like a different value system. Mm -hmm. And I think the definition of gentry has been consistent in England for centuries, but there was a shift in the way people became gentry, the way people rose to be considered gentry in the 1500s. Right, because in the Middle Ages, being elevated to knighthood and given this honor of being called sir was almost exclusively a military honor. You had to earn it in battle. Yes, but after the crowning of Henry VII and his desire to bring peace, it's the end of the War of the Roses, and so many of the nobles died. He needed to create new nobles, and it became a title that could be conferred on someone for almost any service to the crown, not just for valor on the battlefield. And elevating men, again, it was always men, their wives or daughters were just along for the ride. That was a way to ensure gratitude and loyalty to Henry the Seventh or to the monarch. You know, in, in the medieval period, you, you could never knight Laurence Olivier for being a great actor. The Queen continues to do this in the modern period, right? So there's a list of people every year who've done a service to the crown, Sir Paul McCartney, who did a service to the crown by being a great musician, and he can become a sir. But of course, in the Middle Ages, he would have had to have killed somebody with a broadsword, you know, in the name of his lord. Big broadsword. So, a to big hack them. Yeah, so <laughs> I mean it's just it's just different, but that tradition has continued on. Henry the Seventh needed administrators, not fighters, for his new centralized big government. And these administrators were rewarded by the crown by having lands and titles conferred on them. They were given property that they could collect rents from. They weren't compensated by a salary in the way we think of it today. And they became members of the nobility, or quote, gentlemen, this way. Many of these new gentry were dubbed new men, and they were, unsurprisingly, resented by the older aristocracy. Shocking! <laughs> Super privileged people don't want other people to get the same privileges as them? My goodness. I know, then as now. And of course, it was the same thing during Elizabeth's reign. 
she also elevated people and newly elevated gentry rankled those who considered themselves old families. Right. I mean, in our story, Henry Lee says, I do believe the rich merchants hope to overrun the court. And basically what he's saying is, you know, you hope to be given a title for having money. And this was really a preoccupation for these older families or the people who considered their, themselves older families because, of course, every old family was at one time a new family. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> In the last episode, we were talking about banking and Sir Thomas Gresham, who was basically an economic advisor to Queen Elizabeth, a famous one, a great uh, yeah. one. And his father, Richard Gresham, was born without a title. He was a very successful mercer who made a fortune exporting textiles, and he was knighted by Henry VIII. Right, for this service to the crown. And the these Greshams are the kind of, quote, new gentry family that Sir Henry Lee looks down on. And to placate Sir Henry, Philomena answers, oh, sir, the court is for those born to it, those of my sort only wish to be near it. She's kind of laying it on a little yeah. thick there. Because the gentry, the nobility, they want to believe that they are special. And whether or not Philomena believes it, which she probably does, actually. She knows it's what Sir Henry wants to hear. Right. And, and this neat flattery, this reassurance, inspires Sir Henry to boast about his influence with the queen. He tells Philomena that he helped gain back the titles and lands that were taken from the Wyatt family, who, as we know, he's the nephew of Sir Thomas Wyatt, the elder. So as we talked about in the past episodes, Sir Thomas Wyatt the Younger was executed for treason during the Wyatt's Rebellion, and therefore his property was what's called attained. You know, you come across this term in Tudor history a lot attained, especially in Henry's reign, because so many people were executed. More than 50 prominent people and up to 57,000 people in total were executed during his 36-year reign. And that's an incredible amount of people when you, realize, when you think about the population of England at the time. I mean, it's just... It's it's awful. I know, and he he made money from those deaths if the person was wealthy, which I'm sure most of them were. Okay. Yes, if they're because why would he care? Yeah, if they weren't wealthy, and if they're found guilty of treason, which they very often were, and so you're found guilty of tre treason and attained, and that term comes from the old French word attendre, which means strike or condemned. So. Attainder was passed after the penalty of death was given by the court. So guess what? You're going to die. And just to pile on, we're also going to pass an act of attainer against you. And attainer meant that the condemned forfeited all their titles, all their lands, and all their goods, everything, every you know, silver spoon in the house to the crown. It also meant that the children of the condemned lost any hereditary titles or inheritance. So having a husband and a father who was attained was financially devastating for the entire family, generationally, and that does not even begin to talk about the emotional toll on having your loved one executed. executed. Right. Before the rebellion, Sir Thomas Wyatt the Younger lived at Arlington Castle in Kent, which had been acquired by his grandfather, Sir Henry Wyatt, for his services to Henry VII. And Arlington was a 13th century fortified castle. It's situated on massive ground. Sir Thomas the Younger lived there with his wife Jane. And unlike his father, Sir Thomas the Elder, the poet, who spent most of his time at court, the younger son was really a country gentleman. So we've talked about Thomas the Junior's military career on the continent. But when he returned to England in the early 1550s, he basically settled down to be a country gentleman and to live off his estates. He and Jane had nine children. Nine. Five <laughs> sons and four daughters. It's hard to find birth and death dates for all of those children. So they may not have all survived infancy. And I mean, they, statistically, they probably they did. They probably but... did not. But clearly, Sir Thomas the Younger left a large family and a wife when he was executed. And the castle was forfeited to the crown, the crown at the time was Mary I, 
but it seems like Mary I left it empty because the next tenant was not until 1568 when Queen Elizabeth bestowed it on her master of the jewel house, John Astley, who she made into a sir because of his services to the crown. Yes. And then he got a castle. It's, it's sad that Elizabeth didn't return the castle to the Wyatts. Astley did not live there, and the whole place fell into disrepair. And then there was a huge fire, and it was ruined. Apparently, the English artist J.M. Turner thought the ruins were picturesque because he made a number of sketches and really beautiful watercolors of it that you can see online. And the castle was finally refurbished in the 19th century. And now, guess what? You can rent it out for a wedding. <laughs> Which sounds or like a girls' fun. weekend. Yeah. Or a Tudor holiday. Or a Tudor <laughs> holiday. <sighs> that would be so fun. But imagine... And how... Kent is beautiful, too. I imagine the, yeah. kind of the grounds are lovely. That would be fun. But imagine how horrible it must have been for Sir Thomas the Younger's poor wife, Jane. Losing her husband and then having to pack up mm. her whole life, all of her kids try to find somewhere else to live. She has no income. She's lost the income from her lands. And of course she couldn't work. She couldn't get a job. And all she got was a small annuity from Mary the First to just keep her out of the poor house. She lost everything. Right. And it's not like she could then hold the lands in the name of her son until her son would become of age, right? Because her son has also lost his hereditary titles to the land. So it's an understatement to say that the women of this time were completely at the mercy of their husband's decisions. Jane didn't want her husband to lead this ill-fated rebellion in the first place, and when it went bad, she was denied any resources of her own to fall back on. I mean, she couldn't get a job. There were no jobs open to women like her. She just had to try to find a new husband who was willing to take care of her and her children. Or a family member. Right? Or a family or like member. Her father. Maybe they moved, she moved back with her father. Yes. Or she moved with her brother. Or, you know. Yes, maybe a kind uncle. Anyway, when she came to the throne after Mary I, Elizabeth did return the title and some of the goods to the Wyatts. But, as we said, not Allington Castle. And it may well have been Sir Henry Lee who spoke on Jane's behalf. Jane and Wyatt's children would have been Henry's second cousins, I believe. So he had the family connection and he had access to Elizabeth. And Sir Thomas the Younger was an only child, so there were no siblings on his side to put in a good word. And it is true that under Elizabeth, the Wyatt's fortunes did improve, maybe because of Sir Henry Lee. And Sir Thomas Jr.'s eldest son, George, was admitted to the Inns of Chancery and also the Inns of Court when he was a teenager. And if you've read a biography of any of Elizabeth's statesmen, you may have come across a reference to these inns where men went to be educated. Right, and, and George Wyatt entered one of these inns to be educated because he would have had to have taken a trade. Yes. He, he, wasn't a, he, he couldn't live off his lands like his father did. And these inns were not inns as in hotels, but they were places where law was practiced and where law was taught. Although the use of the term inn comes from the fact that they began as hostels because students and teachers who were practicing lawyers would have their chambers there and the students would live there to learn from the, the lawyers who had their chambers. And so many historical figures went there. Sir Thomas More, Sir William Cecil, Sir Francis Bacon, Sir Francis Walsingham. I, it, the list is enormous and they were all students at the Inns of Chancery and the Inns of Court. The list of 16th century alumni reads like a who's who of Tudor political figures. And of course, women were not admitted. No, 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 no. Not until 1920 so many hundreds of years after these inns were founded. But these inns were located in central London, and actually I should say they are located in central London because they're still in use. Don't you love England? Yeah, <laughs> these I These things know. were first built in the 12th and 13th centuries and they're still there being used. And if you look on the August map from 1561 that we've talked about last week, you can see these inns clearly marked between Chauncery Lane and Fetter Lane and I was wondering, actually, if Fetter Lane, the name comes from people coming in there in, in fetters, which would have been if they were prisoners. As we talked about in an earlier episode, the neighborhoods and streets in London were named for what happened there, for the businesses that went on there. 
And on that map, you can even see the trees, the gardens of the inns depicted, and you can imagine how all these young men and their teachers were in these spaces. It's really amazing. It's so wonderful. Right, and attending one of these inns of Chancery was the first step to becoming a barrister. So students participated in moots or simulations of court cases and wrote learning of legal facts. There's two types of lawyers, a solicitor and a barrister. And a barrister is actually the person who argues the case. The solicitor is the one that puts the case together. In America, we have a kind of a different system, I think. But um, anyway, in the 16th century, they would have readers from one of the inns of court who were practicing barristers to come and teach these students about the law. These readers would give lectures on specific points of law and facilitate the moots. It's kind of still a model for the way law schools work. But if a student showed promise at an inn of chancery, he would then matriculate to an inn of court, and he would matriculate to the inn of court that was connected to his inn of chancery. There were ten inns of chancery that fed into four inns of court. So obviously the population got smaller as you went along, mm -hmm. right? The four inns of court were Gray's Inn, Lincoln's Inn, Middle Temple, and Inner Temple. Men went there, young men. Some of them had no intention of getting a degree, as it were, to be a lawyer or to be a barrister or a solicitor. They were really there just to make connections. Right, and I think that was actually true of some of, of, of the universities, too, because a lot of people left without taking a degree, and that wasn't considered a waste of time. You were there, you were exposed, you met people, yeah, and that was it. John Fortescue, a 15th century English lawyer, put it well. He said that the ends of chancery were like maids of honor to the ends of court. Even though maids of honor couldn't go to the inns of chancery or the inns of court. So they used a, he used an analogy of women to, to describe a place where women couldn't attend, but whatever. Um, so George Wyatt was obviously an outstanding student because he made it through the years at the inns of chancery and then he was admitted into Gray's Inn. And Gray's Inn was arguably, at this time, the most prestigious of the four inns during Elizabeth's reign. Don't tell that to the lads who went to Middle Temple. <laughs> no, it's like Princeton and Harvard, right? Then is now. I'm sure there was a lot of rivalry between the inns. Gray's Inn did have the honor of Queen Elizabeth's patronage. And with the influence of members like Sir William Cecil, it became the largest with something like 200 members. The whole system of educating lawyers this way fell apart when the English Civil War broke out. And it, it never really got completely back on track just at the inns of court. And now the inns of court are more like associations or clubs that lawyers in England are members of. And I actually believe that you may have to be a member of an inn of court to serve in England, mm. to serve as a lawyer in England. But the inns, especially Gray's Inn, was very important in the development of English theater. Yes. And mm, it's very interesting. And we're going to talk more about that when we go to visit George Wyatt at Barnard's in a, in a later episode. But for now, we'll leave Philomena to return Sir Henry Lee's sexy correspondence, and we'll leave Constance to try to get over her disappointment about not finding any clues to the relic. But join us next time when we go back in time to see what's happening between Anne Boleyn and Sir Thomas Wyatt. And if you're enjoying this podcast, tell a friend. Yeah. So we really appreciate all your support, all of our gratitude for listening, and we look forward to bringing you the next episode and more tutor-minded talk. Mm -hmm.